Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted that you've decided to join us. You probably know by now that we study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this is the series on stewardship, Motives of the Heart. It's been an interesting series so far. I hope it's expanded your understanding of stewardship. This is lesson number nine in that series for March 3 of 2018. And as usual, we'd like to ask you to bow with us in prayer as we begin. Our wonderful Father, it is a privilege for us to talk about the ways in which we can partner with you to accomplish what needs to be accomplished to finish up the work here on this earth. May we understand those issues and responsibilities more clearly, and may we take up our part of that as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. This lesson's entitled, Offerings of Gratitude. So we apparently have gone beyond the tithing business, and now we're talking about what you might give voluntarily, gratitude. And we've demonstrated already many times in our discussions together that the difference between God's kingdom, which is based completely on love, and Satan's kingdom, which is based completely on selfishness, should be obvious to everybody. It's certainly clear that we do not even begin to realize how generous God has been in sending us Jesus, especially. I mean, Ellen White goes on to say that it, all heaven was at risk in the offering of Jesus. But even we, as and you remember Jesus' comments to this effect, even we humble human beings know how to, good, good, know how to give good gifts to the people that we love, the people we care about. So what do we know about God's love? Well, it's pretty phenomenal stuff. It's way beyond anything we can even comprehend. Giving is, I think without even a question being raised, is fundamental to the characteristics of God. If we want to be like Him, and that should be our goal in the plan of salvation, then absolutely we, meet, we need to learn to give in a loving, agape kind of way as He does. And that would suggest to us that to say a word like selfish Christian is an oxymoron. It's just as about as contradictory as you can possibly be. So what is it that we have to give? Do we have anything that God hasn't given us? Do we have anything to give back? Well, we've talked about the tithe, but it, do, we, do we need to give anything beyond that? Well... In the Old Testament, and even in the New, we find that people gave fairly generous offerings. Uh, in fact, when it came time to build a tabernacle at the foot of Mount Sinai, Moses had to finally tell them, stop giving, we, we can't use any more. I mean, that's pretty generous giving, I would say. Those were slaves, or had just come out of slavery. I think, well, what, I think I what, understand what kind of wealth did they have? They had gotten jewelry from their slave masters. Mm-hmm. As Not just left. jewelry, probably other things of value. Yeah. Money, probably. Although they didn't have coins or anything like that in those days like we're familiar with now. Nothing, I don't know what form of portable wealth they had in those days. Maybe, like you say, maybe it's just jewelry. Gold. Obviously gold. Gold. Rings of various yeah, sizes. Yeah, probably, yeah. Okay, well, there's some couple things that... Uh, Christ said about wealth, and Paul said about wealth. Carrie, could you uh, fill us in there? Yes. I'm quoting Matthew 6, 19 to 21. Do not store up riches for yourselves here on earth, where moths and rust destroy, and robbers break in and steal. Instead, store up riches for yourselves in heaven, where moths and rust cannot destroy, and robbers cannot break in and steal. For your heart will always be where your riches are. And then I'll go on to Colossians 3, 1 to 2. You have been raised to life with Christ, so set your hearts on the things that are in heaven, where Christ sits on his throne at the right-hand side of God. Keep your minds fixed on things there, not on things here on earth. Both of those texts come from the Holy Bible, the Good News Translation, 
from the American Bible Society. Thank you. Well, why do you suppose this principle of giving and loving uh, became a part, a central part of Christ's Sermon on the Mount? Because that was his character and his father's <laughs> Exactly. I mean, he's all just talking about, okay, this is the way we are, right? Father and I, are. that's the way we are. So, if you want to be like us, you need to be like that. So now we need to ask the difficult question, how many of us are actually living like that? It, do we find it's true that where your treasure is, your heart will be also? Anybody found a compelling reason why we should not believe those words? So what does it mean to store up your treasure in heaven? How permanent are our treasures stored here on this earth? Gary, I think there's a comment there you can add. On earth, everything is unstable, uncertain, and insecure. It is subject to decay, destruction, stealing, and loss. Heaven is the opposite. Everything is internal, durable, secure, and imperishable. In heaven, there is no loss. It's from Adelina, who is that? Alexei. Oh, Alexei. Where your heart belongs and beyond blessings. Okay. That's also quoted in our Adult Sabbath School Bible Study Guide for Sunday, February 25. So, and, and there's another principle that we need to keep in mind here in terms of dealing with wealth and so forth, and that's that whether we have a lot or whether we have a little, sooner or later, we have to give it up, don't we? Either because we pass off the scene or because something happens to it in one way or another. Uh, that's, just, that's just the way things are here on this, this earth. And, of course, worst of all is that you might be part of some fires or you might be part of uh, floods. I mean, what's happening to our world? Uh, disasters of all kinds or, or a thief breaks in and steals everything. So what, what is the draw, what is the pull of treasure? Why power. Does it there's power. Your, gives you power to do to buy things, to buy people, to so money is really go places, a, do yeah, things. Okay. Money is a really a, a way of concentrating human effort, work. It's a way of saying, you know, I, I've, I've done this much of value and therefore I can use that to purchase things, to do things, and so forth. Isn't treasure, though, kind of relative? I mean, you can have you can have heaven, the kingdom of heaven you're working for is your treasure. Mm -hmm. Christ is your treasure. Mm -hmm. So the, the thing still works um, either way. It's just what you make your treasure out to be. Yeah, exactly. I mean, how much treasure did Paul have just before his head was cut off? Well, he had Christ. There he you go. Had, he had the, the hope for the next life. Yeah, exactly. Well, we all know about the draw and the pull of, of, of treasure. To some, it, it coerces, it draws, it demands, it allures, and it seems to focus on, you know, um, I mean, what happens to the people who go to Las Vegas and places like that and gamble away their, their money, hoping, for, hoping they're going to get that jackpot? Or, or, you, or they, you play the lottery. Wow. Well... If we, if we still hold on to whatever we have and think it belongs to us, uh, does that mean we're not truly followers of Jesus? Well, and, and the spirit wars against the flesh, so it's, it's not always as black and white <coughs> as we'd like to make it mm -hmm. out to be. And we don't want to get into the trap of, well, if I still have this, then maybe I'm not really a Christian after all. And and follow that deception, but uh, yeah. we, we still need to, to w when it comes to our attention, to turn and, and seek, uh, seek Christ and, and uh, resolution of that conflict. Yeah, and there's the, the other challenge. I mean, uh, there, are, there have been people in the past who have said, and I, I don't want to use the, widow's my, the widow and her mites at that point, as an example, but there are people who say, well, I'll just give away everything because I don't have very much anyway, and I'll just, 
expect the church or the or God to support me is that's not that's not a responsible approach either um, we need to prepare to take care of ourselves and and if we have children or something be responsible for families etc so there's that balancing act um, we're not we shouldn't try to uh, you know get rid of that so Paul has some things to say about all of this. Dennis, do you want to pick up Hebrews 10 there for us? Yeah, Hebrews 10, 34. You shared the sufferings of prisoners, and when all your belongings were seized, you endured your loss gladly because you knew that you still possessed something much better, which would last forever. Good News Bible. Now, it's interesting. We don't know for sure who wrote Hebrews. I mean, it doesn't indicate in Hebrews anywhere. And we're not even sure exactly to whom it was written. Speculation is that Paul wrote it, and I, I believe that. Um, and considering the sophistication of the writing and so forth, he probably was assisted by Dr. Luke, of course, was also Greek, Greek physician. But they, it, it, it appears that it was written to a group of young scholars who were maybe preparing to be missionaries or ministers of some kind. We don't know exactly, obviously, suffering the, you know, shared the sufferings of prisoners when all your belongings were seized. We don't know if they were seized by the government or where they were stolen. I mean, there's a lot of details about that verse. We, we just don't know. We don't have any idea. Well, so now let's, let's, let's balance the scales here a little bit. How much do we have that God has not given us? Nothing. Nothing. That's pretty nothing. simple, isn't it? <laughs> one, one word, nothing. Okay, well, of course, one of the most important things he's given us is, is salvation. And Dennis, I think you have another passage from Paul there. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. For it is by God's grace that you have been saved through faith. It is not the result of your own efforts, but God's gift, so that no one can boast about it. Good News Bible. So if we... If we receive that gift, that one gift, salvation, does anything else really matter? I mean, compared to, compared to anything else you can compare it with, you, you can't even put it on the same scale. Everything else will pass away. But if we enter eternity, then yeah. we have everything. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and again, just to repeat something we've already said in earlier lessons, there's no way we can earn it. It absolutely has to be a gift from God, okay? It's undeserved. Um, we don't like to admit it, but the truth is we're all sinners. And as sinners, we don't deserve anything except eternal, you know, nothingness. Uh, just to, to be, you know, destroyed and, and gone. And Peter said something about the amazement of all of that to people and to even to angels, I think. Gordon? 1 Peter 1, 12. <clears throat> God revealed to these prophets that their work was not for their own benefit, but for yours, as they spoke about those things which you have now heard from the messengers who announced the good news by the power of the Holy Spirit from heaven. These are things which even the angels would like to understand. Wow. So if God hadn't offered us salvation as a gift through grace, by faith, you know, his, Paul's words, nothing else would really matter. We would have what? We would have this have relatively miserable life and that would be it, right? Mm -hmm. That was the approach of the Sadducees way back in Jesus' day. Um, and the approach of a lot of people today, you know. Uh, you've heard say, people say things like, well, grab all the gusto you can, you know, and, you know, live, eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow you die. And But there is salvation. We know it's possible. And it's possible because God has given it to us. So, <clears throat> but our lessons are about stewardship. Well, so what does that have to do with this whole thing? Um, Gordon, another First Peter there? First Peter 4.10 Each one, as a good manager of God's different gifts, must use for the good of others the special gift he has received from God. Okay, so 
Sure, God has given us a lot of things, including talents. Each of us have talents, each of us have uh, 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 gifts of possessions and so forth. So what are we supposed to use those for? Bless others, glorify God. Exactly, and, and in previous lessons we've said these gifts are supposed to be used for the upbuilding of the entire church, right? And uh, using the expression from the King James Version, it's described as stewards, of, we are described as stewards of the manifold grace of God. What does that mean? Manifold grace of God. Everything we need and Entire. more than we can imagine. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, does it not mean that if he has been gracious and merciful uh, and generous with us that we should be in turn mm -hmm. the same merciful generous and gracious to others yeah there are a few examples in scripture of just unbelievable gifts that um, people have given um, we know about the widow who gave her two mites and that was her all now, it probably wasn't absolutely all. She probably had a place to stay, and she probably had clothes and so forth like that. But she was given all her monetary wealth, apparently, that she ever had. There's another incredible story of a gift, unbelievable gift, and that was the story of Mary. Um, it's recorded in Luke 7, 37 to 47. It's a story that's fairly familiar to most Christians. Let me read a part of that story, and it's repeated in other other gospels somewhat. In that town was a woman who lived a sinful life. She had heard that Jesus was eating in the Pharisee's house, so she brought an alabaster jar full of perfume and stood behind Jesus with his, by his feet, crying and wetting her, his feet with her tears. Then she dried his feet with her hair, kissed them, and poured the perfume on them. When the Pharisee saw this, notice there's no mention of any names here so far. When the Pharisee saw this, he said to himself, If this man really were a prophet, he would know who this woman is who is touching him, and he would no know what kind of sinful life she lives. Well, Jesus spoke up and said to him, Simon, now we have a name, I have something to tell you. Yes, teacher, he said, tell me. Now, what do we know about Simon so far? What, 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 other than the fact that he was a Pharisee. Probably fairly well off. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Financially. What had Jesus done for him? Healed him of a leprosy, bad disease. Right? Healed him of leprosy, yeah. So, you know, here he is despising other people, and he's been healed of leprosy. When he was supposed to be going around crying, unclean, unclean, unclean. Well, so Jesus goes on. There were two men who owed money to a money lender. Jesus began. One only 500 silver coins, and a silver coin would be a... a the wages of a working man for a day, and the other owed him 50. Neither of them could pay him back, so he canceled the debts of both, which one then will love him more. I suppose, answered Simon, that it would be the one who was forgiven more. You're right, said Jesus. Then he turned to the woman, and uh, turned to the woman, but he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your home, and you gave me no water for my feet. Now, what was expected of hostess and hosts and hostess in Jesus' day? Set them down. Yeah, there was supposed to be a servant there, and they, at least, and to wash people's feet when they came. And, and, but she has washed my feet with her tears and, washed, and dried them with her hair. You did not welcome me with a kiss, but she has not stopped kissing my feet since I came. You provided no olive oil from my head, and that's if you want to really respect somebody, you would do that. But she has covered my feet with perfume. I tell you then, the great love she has shown proves that her many sins have been forgiven. But whoever has been forgiven little shows only a little love. So all of a sudden, <laughs> Simon's thinking. He must, have, he must have been struggling a little bit at that point. Then Jesus said to the woman, your sins are forgiven. The others sitting at the table began to say to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? But Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you go in peace. They should have been saying, forgive me too. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, 
What do we know about this alabaster box and the spikenard that was in it? Expensive. Very. Yeah, estimates have been made that it, was, it, it would be equal to a working man's wages for a year. So this was no small gift. And where did she get that money? From the abundance of her wealth. <laughs> yeah. And where did she get that wealth? From well, Simon. Huh? From Simon. Maybe. From her uncle. It's quite possible. We know that the, uh, the, the, Sa the Pharisees were never allowed to be more than 6,000 people among all the Jews. Millions of Jews, never more than 6,000 could be Pharisees. And usually it was channeled down through families. So it's quite possible that if Simon was a Pharisee, that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were also belonged to a Pharisee, to a Pharisee family. Um, so we know a lot about Mary because of other things that, that the Bible says, but some very, very provocative things that Ellen White said. So now God's absolute unselfishness awakens human generosity. And nowhere do we find that awakening of generosity in the human heart illustrated more beautifully in Scripture than Mary's act during the feast at Simon's house. Okay? So Myra, you want to take up the story there? Sure. At the table, the, sa the Savior sat with Simon, who had been cured of a loathsome, loathsome disease on one side, and Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead on the other. Martha served at the table, but Mary was earnestly listening to every word from the lips of Jesus. In his mercy, Jesus pardoned her sins. He had called forth her beloved brother from the grave, and Mary's heart was filled with gratitude. She had heard Jesus speak of his approaching death, and in her deep love and sorrow, she had longed to show him honor. At great personal sacrifice, she had purchased an alabaster box of ointment of spike, spikenard, very costly, with which to anoint his body. But now many were declaring that he was about to be crowned king. Her grief was turned to joy, and she was eager to be the first in honoring her Lord. Breaking her box of ointment, she poured its contents onto the head and feet of Jesus, and then she knelt weeping. Moistening them with her tears, she wiped his feet with her long flowing hair. Now, we're going to find out a little bit later what kind of a relationship Mary had with Jesus before all of this happened. But carrying on with the story, Jim, you want to read some more to us? She had sought to avoid observation, and her movements might have passed unnoticed, but, they've oint but the ointment filled the room with its fragrance and published her act to all present. Mary heard the words of criticism. Her heart trembled within her. She feared that her sister would reproach her for extravagance. The master, too, might think her improvident. Without apology or excuse, she was about to shrink away when the voice of the Lord was heard, Let her alone. Why trouble ye her? He saw that she was embarrassed and distressed. He knew that in this act of service she had expressed her gratitude for the forgiveness of her sins, and he brought relief to her mind. The fr fragrant gift which Mary had thought to lavish upon the dead body of the Savior, she poured upon his living form. Wow. Okay. So remember, this was a little bit before the... Um, the, the triumphal entry. And of course, the people who had come with, with Jesus up from, well, traveled with him from, from Galilee and at least from uh, Perea on the other side of Jordan and traveled up that road from, from Jericho up to Jerusalem were saying, we're going to remember, and we're going to make him king. Now, they hadn't, that hadn't happened yet, but this was the whispering going on, you know, he's here. We're not, well, I don't care what the Pharisees say, I don't care what the Sadducees say, we're going to crown him king. And so, you know, she's hearing the whispering. She's heard all this stuff. And so now she thinks she's going to be the first one to honor the new king, right? Dennis, you want to carry on for us there? 
Mary knew not the full significance of her deed of love. She could not answer her accusers. She could not explain why she had chosen that occasion for anointing Jesus. The Holy Spirit had planned for her, and she had obeyed his promptings. Inspiration stoops to give no reason. An unseen presence, it speaks to the mind and soul and moves the heart to action. It is its own justification. Christ told Mary the meaning of her act, and in this he gave her more than he had received. In that she hath poured out this ointment on my body, he said, she did it for my burial. As the alabaster box was broken and filled the whole house with its fragrance, so Christ was to die. His body was to be broken, but he was to rise from the tomb, and the fragrance of his life was to fill the earth. Christ hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling savor. These words come from the Desire of Ages. Page 558 to 563. But there's more to the story. Christ might have extinguished every spark of hope in Mary's soul, but he did not. The heart searcher read the motives that led to her actions, and he also saw the spirit that prompted Simon's words. Seest thou this woman, he said to him, she is a sinner, I say unto thee, her sins which are many are forgiven. For she loved much, but to whom little is given, the same loveth little. And he said unto her, Thy sins are forgiven. Those present, thinking of Lazarus, who had been raised from the dead by Christ, and who was at this time a guest in his uncle's house, began to question, saying, Who is this that forgiveth sins also? But Christ continued, Thy faith hath saved, hath saved thee, go in peace. That's from Signs of the Times um, and also elsewhere, but May 9 of 1900. And I guess I read some other people's passages there. Um, <laughs> Dennis, since Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were, were siblings, it means that Simon was also Mary's uncle. I think you have a comment there. Or is it Ger Carrie? Go ahead. No. Or, or oh, I read Carrie's and, and Gary's P P thing by Act. We did that. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> we did that last time. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, Simon had led into sin the woman he now despised. She had been deeply wronged by him. But Simon felt himself more righteous than Mary, and Jesus desired him to see how great his guilt really was. He would show him that his sin was greater than hers, as much greater as a debt of 500 pence exceeds a debt of uh, 50 pence. Desire of Ages 566.5. Wow. So here's a case of, what do we call that? When someone in the family abuses another person in the family? Incest. incest. That's called incense. Yes. incest. Incest. <coughs> wow. What a, what a case. And so Mary was probably not even invited to this feast. She probably invited herself. Martha, remember, who's the, who was the consummate hostess, was probably the one responsible for all the affairs. And here's Jesus sitting with Lazarus on one side and Simon on the other side. One, he's healed from leprosy, and the other, he's, he's raised from the dead. And here are these two sisters, one who is a consummate hostess, probably doing everything, and the other one who sneaks in and all of a sudden is the star of the show. So, where do we go next? From Pardon? Desire of Ages, page 568, paragraph 2. When to human eyes her case appeared hopeless, Christ saw in Mary capabilities for good. He saw the better traits of her character. The plan of redemption has invested humanity with great possibilities, and in Mary these possibilities were to be realized. Through his grace, she became a partaker of the divine nature, <clears throat> the one who had fallen and whose mind had been a habitation of demons, was brought very near to the Savior in fellowship and ministry. <clears throat> it was Mary who sat at his feet and learned of him. 
It was Mary who poured out upon his head the precious anointing oil and bathed his feet with her tears. Mary stood beside the cross and followed him to the sepulcher. Mary was first at the tomb after his resurrection. It was Mary who first proclaimed a risen Savior. Desire of Ages, you mentioned 568. Now, in order to, to document that we, these, these things aren't something that somebody just dreamed up, look at Luke chapter 8. Now, in Luke's Gospel, this comes right after telling the Mary story that we read earlier. And this is what it says. Sometime later, Jesus traveled to towns and villages preaching the good news about the kingdom of God. The twelve disciples went with him, and that's what we usually think. Okay, here's Jesus walking with a bunch of men, and they're traveling from village to village doing their thing. But it goes on, and so did some women who had been healed of evil spirits and diseases. Mary, who was called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had been driven out. Wow. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, she was a society woman. And Susanna and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. What do you think about a bunch of men, many of whom were probably single, traveling around with other people's wives and prostitutes? And Well, God doesn't bother to give explanations for what he wants to do. He just does it. Amazing. Okay. So, and now I, I'd like to ask you out there to think for a moment about this question. Do you think any church committee would have chosen a former demon-possessed prostitute to be the first person to hear and spread the gospel of a risen Savior? Somehow, I, I just can't quite imagine that. <laughs> I was going to say then or now. <laughs> then or now, right. Wow, that's amazing. And of course, we can read about that. Let me just read a few verses of that. John 11. Mary stood crying outside the tomb while she was... Because now the tomb's empty. While she was still crying, she bent over and looked in the, in, in the tomb and saw two angels there dressed in white, sitting where the body of Jesus had been, one at the head and the other at the feet. Woman, why are you crying? They asked her. She answered, they have taken my Lord away and I do not know where they have put him. Then she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Woman, why are you crying? Jesus asked her. Who is it that you are looking for? She thought that he was a gardener, so she said to him, If you took him away, now, filling the story together, probably her, her eyes were so full of tears that she couldn't see clearly. Uh, she thought he was a gardener, so she said to him, If you took him away, sir, tell me where you have put him, and I will go and get him. And of course, what did she have in mind? She knew that just a little ways away, there was an empty tomb that Jesus himself had emptied, right? And she could take the body of Jesus and put it over there if necessary. But then Jesus said to her, Mary. She had turned towards him and said in Hebrew, Rabboni, this means teacher. And of course, uh, then, and w was this the first person who had actually come to the grave? That's a trick question. What's the sequence, do you remember? Mary had come first. She found the tomb was empty. She raced to see the disciples and said, what's happening here? And they didn't know. So Peter and John raced to the, to the tomb. They didn't find anything. Jesus could have easily have revealed. And meanwhile, there were other women who had come to the tomb. Jesus could have revealed himself to any of them. He didn't. They all left. And here comes Mary back crying. And so God chooses to reveal himself to her. What's going on here? And this is Mary Magdalene, not Mary, the mother of Jesus. No, this is Mary Magdalene. Very clearly, it's Mary Magdalene. Yeah. Yeah, that's, um, that should say something to us about forgiveness, right? Well, our subject for this week is generosity. And we don't know how Mary got money to pay for that alabaster box, but it was certainly a, a generous gift. I don't think that anybody could ask any questions about that. Look at some other passages about specific instructions about giving gifts. Look at Exodus thirty-four twenty-six. Each year bring to the house of the Lord the first corn that you harvest. Do not cook a young sheep or goat in its mother's milk. Huh? What does that have to do with anything? 
Well, the first corn brought the harvest. When, when, when did they bring that to... Uh, of course, the, this is... I'm reading an English translation here. The first corn, that would be the first wheat or the first barley. When's that, when does that come ripe? Ready to harvest? Summer. May, June, early, early in the summer. And what feast happens at that time? That's Pentecost. That's the time of Pentecost. And they were expected to bring their, the first fruits of their, of their har harvest for that year to offer at the time of Pentecost. Then in Leviticus, the numbers, well, I guess we can look at these briefly. If you are to be accepted, it must to be accepted, talking about these gifts, it must be a male without any defects. If you offer any animal that has any defect, the Lord will not accept it. When anyone presents a fellowship offering to the Lord, whether it's fulfillment of a vow or as a free will offering, the animal must be without any defect if it is to be accepted. Why is he so particular? Anybody? Well, the because it related to the pro, you know prophetically to Christ yeah. in, in, as the sacrifice, so it needed to be without blemish, needed to be male apparently, and uh, um, you don't now want to give God your second stuff anyway. Yeah, yeah. Now, what's this stuff about cooking goats and or sheep and mother's milk kind of stuff? What's that about? It's one of the Canaanite pagan practices. That was a Canaanite fertility cult pagan practice. And so God is just saying, please do not get involved. Don't even, don't <laughs> even do anything similar to what those people do so that you'll be tempted to go that way. Was that in the 70s that they finally found that out? Somewhere when they were in the Rosh 70s, Shammer? maybe even 80s. It wasn't, it's Rosh been Shammer relatively recently, yeah. Okay, who do we have next? Me. Okay. Entire devotion and benevolence, prompted by grateful love, will impart to the smallest offering, the willing sacrifice, a divine fragrance, making the gift a priceless of priceless value. But after willingly yielding to our Redeemer all that we can bestow, be it ever so valuable to us, if we view our debt of gratitude to God as it really is, all that, we may ha all that we may have offered will seem to us very insignificant and meager. But angels take these offerings, which to us seem poor, and present them as fragrant offering before the throne, and they are accepted. I sometimes tell a story, this is of course a made-up story, about um, the, you know, the, the joking thing about how Peter keeps the gates to heaven and so forth, and you have to pass the gates before you can get in, and so he always asks everybody as they're coming in, you know, whatever. Well, this story, again, of course, it's a made-up story, but jokingly, the word came down from heaven, according to this story, that you could bring one suitcase with you to heaven. And this guy started, wow, a suitcase. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a lot of money with me. So he started collecting U.S. currency, and then he thought, you know, I, I don't know. They, they'll, I don't know. If they're not even sure they'll accept U.S. currency up there in heaven. Maybe I better collect gold. So he starts collecting these bars of gold and puts it in. Gets a big old suitcase, puts it in there. He can hardly lift the suitcase. And of course, according to the story, he shows up at Peter's gate, and he said, "Peter says, what do you have in that suitcase?" He says, "Oh, he says, let me show you. Open up. Here's all this gold." And, Peter said, why did you want to bring all that pavement up here? Yes, yes. <laughs> the streets in heaven are paved with gold, right? So uh, our, our, whatever gifts we, can, we could bring back that would, would be of insignificant worth compared to what's up there in heaven. Well, we've already talked about the woman who gave her tiny, two tiny copper coins known as mites. That woman gave not only a tithe, but also she gave everything she had. So well, that's not just a tithe, that's a generous gift, right? What she demonstrated was her true motives. Well, talk, let's talk about some other things. Paul had heard of the very difficult situation that Jewish Christians were experiencing in Jerusalem. How many years had Paul spent in Jerusalem? Do we know? Where was he and what was he doing in Jerusalem? Studying with Gamaliel. 
He studied for a number of years with Gamaliel, yes. And then for a while he was a member of the Sanhedrin, wasn't he? So he, he was very familiar with Jerusalem. So he wanted them to understand that, not, now he's not talking about the Jews, he's talking about the Christian Jewish church leaders. Who would those people be? Do we dare to ask that? Would that be Peter and John and James, James the brother of Jesus, and some others like them? Well, he wanted them to recognize that even though he had been called to carry the gospel to the Gentiles, he hadn't forgotten about his relatives, if you will, other Jews who become Christians back in Jerusalem. So he spelled out very clearly to um, the people in Corinth who were fairly well off at that point in time um, about what he expected of them. And I'm going to just take a moment and read a couple of these verses from 2 Corinthians 8. 8 through 15. I'm not laying down any rules, Paul says, but by showing how eager others are to help, I'm trying to find out how real your own love is. You know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, which as he was, he made himself poor for your sake, in order that you, in order to make you rich by means of his poverty. And then he goes on. I'm not, don't read the whole. I'm not going to read the whole thing. He's just saying someday those people are going to probably be well off, and you're going to be poor, and then they're going to be giving back to you. And by the way. They are also the one, already the ones who shared the good news of the gospel with you, right? So now, coming down to our day. What are your motives when you give to the church? Why do people give anything? Well, there's a whole spectrum, all the way from pure love to egotism. I mean... Some people give so they get their names plastered on a building somewhere. Is that pure love or is that... Uh, anything but. Hmm? I say anything but. Anything but, okay. So where are we on that spectrum? Okay, have we done anything in the last month that's purely even self-sacrificial? Do we, do we sacrifice at all? Do we suffer at all because of what we have given? Well, God challenges us to study daily the life of Christ. As we see how loving and giving he was, it should motivate us to follow his example. Is there anything wrong with just giving out of sense of obligation? I mean, we have to pay our tithes, right? We're, we're obliged to do that, right? Well, NY has some very interesting words to say about that. Jim? The man who attempts to keep the commandments of God from a sense of obligation merely because he is required to do so, will never enter into the joy of obedience. He does not obey. When the requirements of God are accounted a burden because they cut across human inclination, we may know that the life is not a Christian life. True obedience is the outward working of a principle within. It springs from the joy of righteousness, the love of the law of God. The essence of all righteousness is loyalty to our Redeemer. That will lead us to right, to do right, because it is right, because it, because right doing is pleasing to God. Uh, Ellen White from Christ Object, Object Lessons, pages 97 and 98. Wow. So if we don't give generously, lovingly, we give just because we think we're supposed to, or maybe we give because we want other people to see us giving, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees did in Jesus' day. Do we get any credit for that? We use that term credit as, as if somebody's keeping score or has yeah. a balance sheet. In fact, some think, well, your, your good deeds overpower your uh, negative characteristics yeah. and... Uh, as if God has a calculator and that's the way that's as, a, the, as a printout for you. That's that's the way our largest Christian church does things. Well, we miss an opportunity to grow in God's grace and to draw closer to Him. So it, that's I don't see that so much as a something uh, required. Require you know it's it's just what you're supposed to do when you love someone. Yeah, it's not. Uh, I got to do this, or I need to do this and then that. And 
those things can be observed from the outside looking in and say, yes, there's growth and this is, you know, you can analyze it and everything, but in the midst of it, it's, it's not ca calculated so much in the same way as Mary's act uh, when she brought, she had certain thoughts and, and yet uh, she was confused in the sense that she thought she was g giving to honor him as the king yeah, that yeah. was going to be established and yet the spirit was guiding her to do this uh, and Jesus was able to use it as an object lesson. And how many people actually managed to give something to honor Jesus before he died? Besides Mary, none. <laughs> Besides Mary, none. That's right. And so here's someone who didn't, didn't, she just did it because she felt overwhelming. I mean, she had been healed of demon possession. She had been healed of her sinful life and forgiven. And that just overwhelmed her. She thought she had to do it. Well, does God ever ask us to do anything which is not ultimately for our best good? You, 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 I, I mean to quibble here, but just to make a, a little more emphasis. Okay. What she said, or what she felt, that she had to do it. No, I think it just was a, a response yes. that it was just, uh, she was gotten so in tune with, with the Creator, with Jesus, uh, yeah. it, uh, it was no obligation, it wasn't that sense of obligation. No, no, we no, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. with you completely. That's, that's yeah. She just, her, her it, she would just, she couldn't think of anything yeah. else that would, that would even come close to expressing what she wanted to say. Well, if we're going to eventually become a part of God's kingdom, and that kingdom operates completely out of love, shouldn't we start practicing that right now? Could we actually learn while on this earth that it is more blessed to give than to receive? And Dennis, I think you have a word on that. True faith and true prayer how strong they are. They are as two arms by which the human supplicant lays hold upon the power of infinite love. Faith is trusting in God, believing that he loves us and knows what is for our best good. Thus, instead of our own way, it leads us to choose his way. In place of our ignorance, it accepts his wisdom, in place of our weakness, his strength, in place of our sinfulness, his righteousness. Our lives, ourselves, are already his. Faith acknowledges this ownership and accepts its blessings. Truth, uprightness, purity are pointed out as secrets of life's success. It is faith that puts us in possession of these. Every good impulse or aspiration is the gift of God. Faith receives from God the life that alone can produce true growth and efficiency. This comes from Gospel Workers, page 259. Wow. Well, during this series of lessons, we've discussed stewardship in light of our motives. Maybe the one passage that captivates or captures this idea about motives more succinctly than any other in scriptures is found in 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 9. And Gary, did I give that to you or? No, you were gonna. I'm gonna read this, okay. 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 9. Remember that the person who sows few seeds will have a small crop. The one who sows many seeds will have a large crop. You should each give then as you have decided, not with regret or out of a sense of duty. So when we read those words a while ago, Jim, Jim's words from Ellen White, she's really just expounding on what Paul said. For God loves the one who gives gladly. And God is able to give you more than you need so that you will always have all you need for yourselves and more than enough for, er for every good cause. As the scripture says, he gives generously to the needy. His kindness at lasts forever. And of course, that's quoting from the Old Testament. So each time we give, we should do so in the spirit of Christ. And as we give in faith, our faith increases. If faith is a relationship with God as with a close friend, in other words, when we give, what we're really doing is, is 
placing ourselves in partnership with God, aren't we? And surely following his example and thus becoming more like him would be a sign of the friendship he is asking us to learn about. Okay, now Carrie. It will be seen that the glory shining in the face of Jesus is the glory of self-sacrificing love. In the light from Calvary, it will be seen that the law of self-renouncing love is the law of life for earth and heaven, that the love which seeketh not her own has its sort, source in the heart of God, and that in the meek and lowly one is manifested the character of him who dwelleth in the light which no man can approach unto. And that's from Desire of Ages, page 20. Wow. Well, have you personally experienced the reality of seeing your faith grow by giving? Can you... I, I, I know this has been my, my experience. If you, if you find something that you think is really worthy cause and you give to it and you see the results, it's exciting. You, you want to do it more. So a faith-building experience does what? It makes us want to do more. It makes us... Uh, so, Dennis, I guess you're next. Gary. I'm sorry, Gary. I'm sorry, Gary. The spirit of liberality is the spirit of heaven. The spirit of selfishness is the spirit of Satan. Christ's self-sacrificing love is revealed upon the cross. He gave all that he had and then gave himself that men might be saved. The cross of Christ appeals to the benevolence of every follower of the blessed Savior. The principle illustrated there is to give, give. This carried out in actual benevolence and good works is the true fruit of the Christian life. The principle of world, worldings is to get, get, get. And thus they expect to secure happiness but carried out in all its bearing, the fruit is misery and death. Wow. Ellen White, Review and Herald, October 17, 1882, paragraph 11. Get, get, and what's the result? Misery. Misery, misery and death. Why is it that we some people somehow get the idea that if you can just get more, you'll be happier? To people like, uh, I think of examples in the past, some famous people, Howard Hughes, was he really happy? I mean, he was a multi-billionaire. He wasn't happy. Yeah, he, 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 he was insane. I mean, he was doing so many crazy things that I didn't want to think about it. So why is it that as human beings we're, 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 we seem to be so naturally selfish? How did that get started? Because we're empty. Like the man who was swept clean and put in order, he was he was empty. Without Christ there, we just, there's just this vacuum that that truly seeks after God. I think is it C.S. Lewis that uses the illustration of a Christ-shaped hole. hole in our heart or something like yeah. that. Yeah. Uh, but we seek to fill it with other things. Yeah. And, and but you think about the natural history of any given human being. As infants, all we want is give, give, give. I mean, they don't recognize what they're doing, but all they can think about is their own personal needs, right? And so at the, whoever's caring for them has to be Myra. I see Myra smiling. So she has a, what, a three-month-old or six-month-old? Six-month-old. Six-month-old at home. And she's grandchild. Helping, grandchild, grandchild helping to take care of. Yeah. <laughs> As she's, a, yeah. She's an influence of Satan. Yeah. He was the original coveter. And since the fall, he's had his way with us. Yeah, yeah. Well, fortunately, uh, we are all, as we grow up and become more mature, and especially as we have children, we're almost forced into thinking about other people. And sometimes, sometimes that helps us to grow up. A great exercise that each of us should attempt is to make a list of all the things God has done for us. 
we could, we could just go on and on and on. After looking at such a list, could we ever persist in selfishness? Selfishness is the ultimate guarantee of being miserable. The only real happiness comes from giving. So, do we daily think of the many things that God has done for us as our hearts overflowing with gratitude? Are, are our hearts overflowing with gratitude for all these gracious gifts? Well, then shouldn't we find ways to give back? What could we as a church group or as a Sabbath school group, for example, do to keep before our eyes the incredible needs there? There are in other parts of the world. I recently came back from a trip to Cuba. They're wonderful people, so loving and so kind, and yet their poverty is just beyond belief almost. And they're so close to us. Well, God loves a cheerful giver. Do we actually give cheerfully? What would that look like? Well, it is clear in our minds that important distinctions, that, uh, is it clear in our minds, important distinctions between tithe paying and the giving offerings? What, what's the difference there? We're, we're running out of time, but... God has said uh, this, is, this is necessary for you to give. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the rest gives us an opportunity to give willingly uh, from our, the, the rest of what he's given us. And that's an opportunity for us to grow faith, right? Yeah. Yeah, very good. Okay. Well, Jesus went through all those things. Even as a child, he was circumcised. And he went through this, all those things. And, and I mean, I, there's so many more things we could, we could mention, but we're running out of time. Tithe was primarily for the use of supporting the priests and Levites. And even today, we can give extra for the purpose of to tithe if we choose to do so. Ancient times money was given for the building of the sanctuary out by the foot of Mount Sinai and then it was given people gave very generously for the building of the temple in Solomon's day. Um, and so we, we, we leave you with these questions. God asks you to give your tithe and he asks you to give or to return your tithe really that belongs to him and to give generously offerings. We think of the story of Mary and so forth have, have our gifts come even close to that? Think about Judas. That experience on that day led Judas to go out and bargain with the Sanhedrin to sell Jesus to them. Think of the contrast between Mary's gift and Judas. That's the, we'll the thought we'll leave you with. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is for us to partner with you. May we become better at it and may our faith grow is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.